Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? Welcome to our last outdoor service of the season. After this, we're indoors waiting for that terrible six-letter word. Anyway, great to see all of you guys. What a beautiful morning we have. The Lord's provided us with. We're looking forward to worshiping God together, hearing the word preached. So thanks for being here. Uh, just a couple of uh, things to make note of. We talked about last week, I believe it was, or maybe the week before, that uh, we're remodeling the CP Kids Room, and that's going on right now. Well, not right this moment, but uh, at this current season, that room is being remodeled. And so if you can help out, lend a helping hand, that is, and be a part of that, I know the, the ladies that are organizing this whole thing would really appreciate that. So look ahead to announcements regarding work days or get in touch with Emily Will, Vicki Bloom, and they can direct you as to how to be involved. Also, um, there's uh, an Amazon wish list that's been created for items that are needed for this remodel. So please check that out as well. I think uh, there's been a link that's been posted on Facebook and uh, maybe a link will be coming out this coming Friday uh, for the uh, Lifeline or in the Lifeline. So you can take a look at that as well and click on that link. And, and if possible, make some purchases that would help us with this particular remodel. Um, uh, there's going to be a, a children's Christmas musical this year. That um, Yes, yes. Yay. Awesome. I know there's more excitement out there than what was voiced, but yes. Uh, but anyway, uh, my wife will be heading that up, and I think she's going to have help from Monica uh, this year. So we're looking forward to that. Now, next Sunday, there's going to be a chance for you to sign up your kids to be involved in this musical. The first practice is going to be on the first Sunday in October. That's right after service. And then if you want to write it down, the actual production is going to be on Saturday evening December the 11th so that's up and coming you'll hear more about that soon and finally we're gonna have a baptismal service on September the 19th and I think four people have already expressed interest and they're going to be baptized so if you're if you're out there and you haven't said anything yet you haven't let anyone know that you want to be in this baptismal service and you want to uh, follow the Lord in terms of, of uh, being baptized, that is, you have committed yourself, your life to Jesus Christ, and you want to be baptized, then September the 19th is the day that we're going to do that uh, right there at Cross Point. So, so please, uh, please make note of that as well. So th those services are always great services. So even if you're not being baptized, we look forward to seeing you there. I want to turn your attention to worship now. Um, yeah, I love the Word of God, don't you? Uh, last week, I think it was, when Pastor Day was preaching, he mentioned something about the sovereignty of God. And it wasn't like a major point, but um, he just alluded to the sovereignty of God in his sermon. And, and that kind of um, grew and developed for me over the week. I just thought again and again about the sovereignty of God. And you know what I thought? I thought... Uh, what an awesome truth in light of where we're at right now in history, right? I mean, to be, be reminded of the fact that God is in control. He is absolutely, totally, completely in control. And that's in the midst of a chaotic world. And it's also true in the midst of our sometimes chaotic lives. Like, like you might feel that things are just going completely awry in your life. And you're, you're just holding on to God with, with the little strength that you have. You might feel that sin is winning out in your life. And, and you know, holiness is not really winning the day. But, but yet you're holding out and holding on to God. Trust in His sovereignty. You know why? Because He said He's going to complete what He started in you. Amen. And His word is true. And he's going to get you through whatever's happening around you. He's going to get you through all the chaos. I want to lead you into worship with those thoughts this morning. So let's go to prayer and ask the Lord to bless what we're about to experience. Father, we submit ourselves to you. 
And we just rest in your presence right now as we reflect on your sovereignty. You are a great, awesome God. There is no power. There is no authority. There is no presence or being that is higher than you. <laughs> you are the, the greatest being in this entire universe and everything holds together. Everything holds together by the word of your power. And we might be gripped with fear many times by what we see going on around us as we watch the news and hear all the reports of what's happening in the world, all this talk of pandemics and things of that nature that, that introduce great fear into our lives. But beneath it all, you're in control. We rest in your sovereignty today. Our hope is in you. You are our rock. complete what you started in us and in our lives. We're so thankful today to be here worshiping you. We look forward to the worship now. Pray that you would bless our time of worship. May you just help us to focus in on you and just minimize all the distractions. Even though we're outside, help us to focus on you and bless the preaching of your word that is to come with Pastor Dave. In Christ's name, amen. But well, would you all stand and join us as we open our service in worship? No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name have I ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. Oh no, no sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name have I ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. Oh, you are the life to my heart and my soul. You are the light to the darkness around me. You are the hope to the hopeless and broken. You are the only truth and the way. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name have I ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name have I ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. You are the light to my heart and my soul. You are the light to the darkness around me. You are the hope to the hopeless and broken you are the only truth and the way to my heart and my soul. You are the light to the darkness around me. You are the hope to the hopeless and broken. You are the only truth and the way. At your name the mountain shake Crumble. At your name, 
the oceans roar and tumble at your name angels will bow the earth will rejoice your people cry out lord of all the earth we shout your name shout your name filling up the skies with endless praise endless praise yahweh yahweh we love to shout your name oh lord at your name the morning breaks in glory at your name creation sings your story at your name angels will bow the earth will rejoice your people cry out lord of all the earth we shout your name shout your name Filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing, we will sing. There is no one like our God. We will praise you. Praise you, there's no one like our God. We will sing, we will sing. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. Yahweh, Yahweh. We love to shout your name, oh Lord. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light in darkness tries to hide trembles at his voice trembles at his voice how great is our god sing with me how great is our god and all will see how great how great is our God. And age to age he stands. And time is in his hands. Beginning and the end. Beginning and the end. The God did three in one father spirit son the lion and the lamb the lion and the lamb how great is our god sing with me how great is our god and all will see how great how great is our God. Name above all names. You're the name above all names. You are worthy of all praise. My heart will sing. How great is our God. You're the name above all names. You are worthy of all praise. My heart will sing how great is our God. How great is our God. 
sing with me how great is our God. Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Lord of all the earth, and Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. Yahweh. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. Amen. You may be seated. everyone. My name is Dave, and am I coming through? Do you guys hear me out there? A little bit. A little bit? How's that? Is that better? Okay, all right. Uh, my name's Dave. I am one of the pastors here at Cross Point, and it is great to have you with us uh, on this special Sunday, our last outdoor service, as far as we know, of 2021. And it, what a great morning God has given us to worship. And uh, I see that all of you have chosen to sit in the shade for some reason today. There's like a clear line where everybody's on this side, except for these two guys, which, you know, you guys found a little, your little spot over there. That's cool. Um, hey, I want to guys, give you guys a quick update before we jump into the message this morning. Um, I was just reminded as we were singing that um, uh, Cross Point is hiring right now. And uh, we are hiring a part-time ministry assistant. And uh, at the end of today's service, we're actually going to recognize and honor Nicole Farrell, who's been serving faithfully as our ministry assistant over the past two and a half years. And we're also hiring a full-time pastor of worship and mobilization. And we've hired a company called Chemistry Staffing to help us find this person. We're about eight months into the search, and right now we have nobody because we've, we don't know what we're doing. So we, that's why we hired Chemistry Staffing and... They have been a huge help to us so far and just wanted to let you guys know the search is live. They just started the search on Wednesday. So they're starting to uh, post our job to all different kinds of places, including social media. And over the next at least, I would say, 90 days, they're going to be interviewing and looking for candidates. And we'll keep you posted uh, with any developments. But I just wanted you guys to know the search is live. And we had to go through a whole, all kinds of assessments and things like that over the last couple weeks so that they can understand who we are as a church, and who we're looking for in a pastor. And so we're, uh, so we're accepting applications right now for a part-time ministry assistant, and we're praying that God would lead the right person to us for that ministry assistant and also a pastor of worship and mobilization. So just wanted to give you guys a quick update on that. So last week we wrapped up our series in the book of Acts, which was called the Gospel Gone Viral, and I really enjoyed that series. I hope you guys learned a lot and are being more intentional in your, with your witness in your neighborhood and all of that and, and trusting God as you are a disciple who's on the move with the Gospel of Jesus. Uh, and we're going to jump into a new series in a couple weeks in the book of Genesis. But for the next two weeks, I thought it'd be great for us just to pause and talk about one of my favorite subjects, and that is Jesus and the Heart. And so today and next Sunday, we're going to talk about Jesus and the heart and what that's all about. And the title of today's message is Getting the Order Right. And when I say getting the order right, I am not talking about customer service or <laughs> your fast food order. We're talking about getting the order right in life and, and making sure that we're not putting something that we want right now ahead of something that's way more important. And that's, that's often what we do as, as humans. We choose the thing that we want right now over something that's a lot better because we, we, want, we want what we want and we want it now. And so today we're going to talk about getting the order right. Now, in life, there's a lot of things, like in just everyday life, that it's important to get the order right. For example, I live in a house with five females... <laughs> And so I got to clean out the drains a lot. Uh, it just goes with the territory. Like every month I'm cleaning out 
some drain somewhere that's full of hair. And I learned that there's a certain order that you got to get it right. You, the first thing you have to do is turn the water off. I learned that the hard way. And then you take the pipes apart. And then you pull out the hair. And then you put it all back together. And then you turn the water back on. That's important, in case you didn't know. Uh, when you're grilling, when you're grilling beef, I don't know if you guys knew this, there's a certain order, okay? you you, you got to leave the beef uncovered in your fridge overnight, and then you take it out an hour before you grill it, and you let it get to about room temperature, okay? Then you turn your grill on, and you let your grill get to the desired temperature. Then you put the beef on, and you flip it one time. That's it. That's the proper way and order <laughs> to grill beef. You know, maybe there's, it's a little subjective, but that's the way that I've learned to do it. It's the best way that I've found to do it. Some people just take the frozen patty, throw it on the grill, light it up, and then they flip it every few minutes. That's amateur hour, okay? That's not the right order for grilling. Uh, and then, like, how about, like, when you're putting your makeup on in the morning? Isn't there a certain order to doing that? i, I got to check my notes on this one, actually. Um, you got to start with the foundation, and then you do the concealer, and then you go to, to the blush, and then you, then you move up to the eyes with the eyeshadow and the eyebrows, and then you do your lips, and then you powder. Everyone knows that, right? I actually had to Google that this last week. If you don't apply your makeup in that order, I don't know what would happen. Hopefully your face would recover. But many people struggle to get the order right in life. It's not easy. It's, it, it is easy to put your job or career before your family. It is easy to put pleasure before commitment. It is easy to put your kids before your spouse. It is easy to put the praise of people before the praise of God. All of that is easy. It is hard to get the order right. And, and here's the struggle. We, we naturally live our lives from the outside in rather than the inside out. And, and what do I mean by that? We're conditioned as human beings to pay more attention to the outside. In other words, what we look like, what we wear, how we talk, what we do for a living, what we eat, where we live, how much money we make, how our kids behave, and, and all of that. We, we tend to pay most of our attention to all of those things, and that's backwards. We look at appearances, but what does God look at? Does God see the way that we do? No, he does not. God sees in a totally different way. And if we could see the way God sees, we would start paying a lot less attention to the way people look and the way people talk, and we would start paying more attention to the inner life. And I want to tell you that I have misjudged many people many times in my life. I've misjudged people, and every time I misjudge people, it's because I'm paying attention to appearances and not to the inner life every single time. That's why we, that's why we always misjudge people is because we're looking uh, at appearances and we're not looking and seeing the way that God sees. So I want to share a scripture with you from Matthew chapter 23 where Jesus is speaking to a group of people and he said this. For you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee. First wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. Now, obviously, Jesus is speaking in metaphors, and the cup and the dish represents, it represents the person. And Jesus is saying, you're spending way too much time maintaining the outward appearance, and you're not spending near enough time looking inside, looking inside of yourself, looking at the inner life. Jesus absolutely nails the human condition when he says this. He's speaking to religious people, and religious people always focus more on behavior than grace. And they focus more on behavior than the inner life of the person. These are people who rarely missed a worship service, people who gave a tenth of everything they had to God, people who prayed long prayers and read their Bibles, people who were very careful to say and do the right thing, and it was all about the optics. Their whole life is all about the optics. That word optics is a word we use 
to describe the way something will be perceived by others, and, and that's something we care a lot about. You know, like when someone says, I don't like the optics of this, what they're saying is, I don't like the way this looks to people. I don't, I don't like the way this is going to be perceived or interpreted by people. You know, will we face criticism or pushback for saying this or doing this? And that's all, the, that's all focusing on appearances. It's, it's all focusing on the optics of something rather than what matters. And Jesus basically says, who cares about the optics? Okay, the, the appearance of something means a lot less than what's going on inside. It, it, it matters a lot less than the motive behind the action and behind the words. And there are plenty of people who look and sound impressive, but if we got a glimpse of who they really are as a person, we would not be impressed. Because the truth is, there are some people who will say they love God and care about you, but in reality, they're full of greed and indulgence. Jesus said, Everything they do is to make themselves feel good and look good. And Jesus said, people like that are blind. They're blind to who they truly are. And so if we are paying closer attention to what people see than what they don't see, we are getting the order wrong, and someday it's all going to fall apart. Someday, everything, all the appearances, all those layers of things that, that, we, that people see behind the true that true, um, that true person, that's all going to be stripped away and everyone will be revealed for who they truly are. Everybody. That day's coming for everybody. God's going to strip away the facade. He, the, the curtain's going to be peeled back and Jesus is going to appear on the earth and we're all going to see what's real and what's not. We're all going to see who was pretending and who was the real thing. There's not going to be no more hiding anymore. Everything's going to be laid bare before, before Jesus. And if you are not paying close attention to your inner life now, there will be consequences. And those consequences may come now while you're on the earth, or they may come later. And sometimes the damage cannot be undone. And so here's something that uh, the writer of Proverbs said in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. He sums this up so well. He says, My child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart, for they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. Then he says this. This is really important. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. So here God makes it plain what the right order is. You don't look at the outside first. You look on the inside. Above all else, guard your heart. And what is the heart? What is God talking about when he talks about the heart? The word for heart is used 948 times in the Bible. It is the third most popular word in the Bible behind God and Lord. The word for heart is used more than the various words for love. And it's almost never used to describe the physical heart. It's almost always used to describe the inner life of a person. So what are we talking about when we talk about the inner life of a person? Are we talking about emotions? Are we talking just about the way you feel? Because that's a lot of times how we talk in our modern day American vernacular, like follow your heart, you know, do what feels right in your heart. It's, it's about your feelings. What feels it's about following your gut, right? Is that, is that what God means though when he talks about the heart? And uh, it's, it definitely does include your feelings and emotions. You know, sometimes we talk about emotional intelligence, being able to identify uh, those emotional triggers that you have and how you act on those different emotions, and then being able to manage and control your emotions. That's a very valuable skill, emotional intelligence. But that's the Bible's uh, definition of the heart is much more complex than our definition of emotional intelligence. In fact, in the book of Jeremiah, God said, that the heart is so complex and deceitful that no one can understand it but God. And we need God to tell us what our heart is like and what's in our hearts and then what to do about it because it's, it's way more than we can handle on our own. And Proverbs 4 gives us one of the best definitions for the heart. The author says that, 
The heart is where your life comes from. The heart is what determines how you live, what you say, and, and what you do in any given moment. It all comes from your heart. You talk from your heart. You think with your heart. You act from your heart. You feel with your heart. You work from your heart. You parent from your heart. Life is not about what goes in from the outside. Life is all about what comes out from the inside. Every choice, every word, every action comes from within, comes from the inner life. So listen to what Jesus said in another place in Luke chapter 6 about the heart. He said, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. A tree is identified by its fruit. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart and a bad uh, evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. Notice that both Jesus and in the book of Jeremiah is highlighted the fact that the human heart is the control center of our lives. Are you a good person or a bad person? The only way to know that is to look at the inner life of the person. It's to look past the layers, past the facade, past the appearances. Your heart reveals the, who you really are. Listen to Proverbs 27, 19. As a face is reflected in water, so the heart reflects the real person. What all this means is that you can change your behavior all you want. You can change your habits. You can change your lifestyle. You can stop doing bad things and start doing good things. But at the end of the day, it's your heart that matters. God looks at the heart. This isn't about behavior modification because some of us here work very hard every day to make sure that the people around us do not see what's on the inside, don't we? That's just what we do. We, we work hard to conceal our true nature. We learn what to say to get a job and keep a job. We learn what to say to get married and stay married. We learn what to say to make friends and keep friends. Some of us have developed very complex, effective filters. But the truth is, many, today, many people today are busier hiding their heart than guarding their heart. And God wants us to be the other way around. He wants us to guard our hearts and just be who we are with everyone. So let me ask you this. If, if everything you say and do, if, if the totality of your life flows from your heart, then shouldn't watching and guarding your heart be the first thing you focus on every day? Shouldn't that be the first thing you pay attention to? If your heart is the control center of everything else, then shouldn't you be paying closer attention to what is in your heart than what is in your bank account or what is in your home or, or you know, how many people are liking and commenting on your latest social media post? Author Tim Keller told a story once about a man who was um, serving a life sentence in prison. And there was a reporter who interviewed him and asked him why he did what he did. And the man uh, was, began telling a story about when he was a kid. He said that when he was a kid, uh, his dad had this expensive watch that he kept tucked away in a drawer in his bedroom. And one day he went into his dad's room, took out the watch to look at it, and he accidentally dropped it, and the watch broke. And immediately, the boy put it back in the drawer, and uh, he was just—he was afraid. He didn't know—he didn't want to—he didn't want to get caught. He was afraid of what his dad might say. He felt guilt, guilty and ashamed. And uh, later in the day, his dad found the watch, and he called all of his kids together, and he showed them the watch, and he said, "Which one of you?" is responsible for this. And the boy didn't say anything. He just, he was too overwhelmed with the guilt and the shame and the fear that he stayed quiet. And in fact, he never told his dad uh, about the watch thing. Even as he grew older, never told his dad about it. And then one night, years later, he was driving on a dark road and he struck a child with his car. And in that moment, all that fear and guilt and shame constrained him to drive away. 
And the reason that happened is because he never dealt with what was in his heart from when he was a kid. Never dealt with the fear, never dealt with the guilt and shame. And it didn't go away, it only grew. And it was in some ways just sort of hiding, lurking in the dark, you know, staying underground, you know, not really, not really rising up or presenting a threat until that night on that road. And in that moment, it all came rushing back in full force. And he really didn't have a choice. He had to do what was in his heart. He had to flee. He could have stopped. He could have called the police. He could have taken responsibility for what he did instead. He drove off, and as you, as you all have guessed by now, he was eventually caught, and he's serving this life sentence. And it's all because he didn't deal with the guilt and the fear in his heart. And he's paying with the rest of his life. I, I, one of my earliest memories as a child is uh, I was maybe five or six years old. I, I can remember standing in our kitchen in Milwaukee. We lived in a little bungalow, and I was in there with my mom. And I don't remember what my mom said, but... I must not have liked it because I told her to shut up. And my mom hauled off and slapped me right in the face. And she, she caught my lip with her, with her ring, uh, with the outside of her ring or something like that. And my lips started bleeding. And we were both just shocked. My mom had never slapped me before. And I never told my mom that before. My mom was the most gentle per person I knew up to that moment. And we're both just sitting there like, how did this just happen? And, you know, we didn't weigh the options before. I just, I told her to shut up because of the rebellion in my heart. And she hauled off and slapped me because of the anger in her heart. And then that, and that's just what happened because we act and we, we speak and we act because of what's in our heart. And in that moment, neither one of us had control over that. We just did it. You know, I, I said what I said because of what was in my heart. My mom did what she did because of what was in her heart. That guy in prison left the scene because of what was in his heart. Because whatever is in your heart controls your life. That's how it works because that is how God has created us. If there is something in your heart, it's going to control you. You may not see it, you may not feel it, you may not hear it, but whatever is in there is going to come out in your life because your heart is the wellspring of your life. It, it springs forth. And whatever is in there is flowing out into every conversation, every action, every relationship. Men, if there is lust in your heart, you can try to hide it. You can try to manage it. You, and, and, and we sometimes think that just because it only comes out once in a while, it isn't hurting anybody. But we, you have no idea how much that lust is robbing you and those closest to you of love and intimacy and joy. Lust is a relationship killer. Envy is a relationship killer. Anger is just a life killer. Guilt is a life killer. It just robs us of joy. It robs us of our relationship with God. And there is no way you can filter out the sin that lurks deep within your heart. You can't even see it because the heart is deceitful. And God says it's beyond cure. And my question to you is, are you paying attention to your heart? Are you paying attention to it? Are you feeding your heart first or are you feeding your ego? Is your heart a priority? Is it the priority? And I, I want to wrap this up today by talking about Jesus and the cross. And speaking of getting the order right, you know, at Cross Point Church, and there's a lot of other churches that, that do it this way, you know, there's a... There's all different kinds of preaching styles and, and different sequences that pastors uh, use for preaching and different preaching methods and stuff like that. But at Crosspoint, we have agreed on, on one primary preaching style, an, an order. And, and the order that we always follow is that Jesus is the hero of every story. Jesus is the climax of every message. Jesus is the point of every message. Jesus is the answer to every problem. It's all about him. We believe that the whole, the whole of Scripture is about Jesus, and it points to the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross to bring us back to God. That's what there is all about. And, and, and so that's the sequence we like to follow and we're, we're going to stick to today. And Jesus, we believe, died on a Roman cross. He was executed as an enemy of the state, 
and as an enemy of God. That's how he was treated. Jesus died a humiliating, excruciating death on a cross. And why did Jesus do that? He, he did it by choice. He did it willingly. And Jesus, we're told, did not die to make us more attractive to people. He did not die to make you look better. He did not die to give you an easier life. He did not die so you could make more money. He did not die to give you a healthier, safer life. Jesus did not die to give you a more comfortable life. Or he, and he also didn't die to protect you from bad things and bad people. Jesus died to give you a new heart. That's why Jesus died. He died to give you a heart that longs for God. And that is the main reason that Jesus died. We, without the death of Jesus, we are dead. We're, we're dead in our sins and we are dead to God. Without the cross, we're blind to our true condition. Without the cross, we're big in our own eyes and God is small in our eyes. Without the cross, we are controlled by our sick, deceitful hearts. But through faith in the cross, we come alive. We come alive and the word of God comes alive to us. We are made new. We can finally start living the life God calls us to live. Through faith in the cross, we can see the way God sees. We can see with new eyes. We can see ourselves as we truly are. We can start to see other people as they truly are. And we can, the biggest thing is we can start to see God as he truly is. And, and, and we can start to see that God is a loving father. You can't see that without the cross. If you don't, if most people see God as this distant, you know, all-powerful force at best who just wants to get back at us for all the bad things that we've done or, or he, you know, someday he's going to, there's going to be this ultimate reckoning and we have to pay for all our sins. And, and between now and then, all we can do is negotiate with God and try to get him on our good side. But through faith in the cross, God becomes our loving father and we become his precious children. And that's not because of anything we've done. It's all because of Jesus' death on the cross. We're given a new heart. We're given new eyes. We're given a new kind of life with Christ at the center. And because of the cross, we're accepted by God because we are covered by Jesus and his righteousness. And when God looks at us, he sees, he sees his only son. He sees the righteousness of Christ. So in a few weeks, uh, as I said earlier, we're going to kick off a new, a new series in the book of Genesis. And we're actually going to, this is going to sound crazy. I, I can't even believe we're doing this, okay? We're going to preach through the entire Bible in four years. And we're going to start with Genesis and we're going to end with Revelation. And if I'm alive in four years, hopefully I'll still be preaching in this series and Lord willing. But we're going to uh, align our preaching series with the Gospel Project and everything in that the kids are learning in CP Kids. So every single week, um, if you're a parent, every single week, you'll be hearing on the Sunday service what your kids are hearing in CP Kids. And so we're going to track along, and I think that's going to be a really enjoyable journey for us. And if you don't have kids, it's going to be just as good. Okay, you're just as important to us, even if you don't have kids. And it's going to be a, an awesome series. We're going to go through the whole story of redemption and it's all, and we're going to discover together that it really is all about Jesus. Starting in Genesis 1, and uh, we're going to start with the story of creation. And I'm really, really excited about that. Now, here's why I tell you that, because for those of you who are familiar with the creation narrative, you know that in Genesis 1 through 3, we hear that God created all things. He created the universe. He created human beings in his own image, and it was, it was all very good. But then human beings rebelled against God. And as soon as they rebelled against God, what did they do? They hid from God. The humans hid from God and God came looking for them and they hid from him. They didn't want to be seen anymore by God. And the cross, here, here's, here's what I want to say. Ever since then, humans have been rejecting and hiding from God. It's the same old story. We just keep rejecting God, we keep rebelling against him, and then we keep hiding from God and one another. But the cross of Jesus changes that. The cross of Jesus allows people who have these, we have these sick, sinful, deceitful hearts to come into the light and to be seen 
by God and by each other. And because of the cross of Jesus, people who were once driven by fear and guilt and shame are now have, they now have the boldness to come into the light and say, this is who I am, and I'm covered by the grace of God. Through, I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. And we're a family. And I just want to tell you this morning that whatever's in your heart, all right, I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, you don't have to hide anymore. The power of the cross makes you clean. It makes you right with God. Even with sin in your heart, you can come into the light. You can be who God's called you to be. You can be yourself. God, God loves you even with all the bad stuff. He loves you because of Jesus. Isn't that good news? Isn't that the, like the best news you've ever heard? That's the gospel we preach, friends. And it never changes and it never gets old. So will you pay attention to your heart this week? Will you ask God to show you what's in your heart? Will you make your heart the priority and start living inside out? Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for everyone who's here today and everyone who will watch this later. God, that you would use your word and that you would penetrate our hearts by your Holy Spirit and transform us to be more like Jesus. That we would not be afraid to be who you've called us to be, that we would not be afraid to confess our sins to each other and to receive forgiveness. God, make us humble and make us a church that is honest and a church that trusts in you, a church that is full of grace and the full of the power of the gospel. It's in Christ's name that we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Before I give the benediction today, I'm going to ask uh, Clint and Nicole Farrell to come up here. And I'm going to ask the elders to come up here too. And uh, Nicole Farrell has been serving as our ministry assistant over the last two and a half years. And she works really hard. And she does uh, most of what she does is behind the scenes. She doesn't love the spotlight. Uh, but... <laughs> But we are so thankful for Nicole, and uh, she has, um, God has put on her heart that she has uh, done what she's been asked to do and been faithfully serving, and she has uh, submitted her resignation uh, so that she can focus more on her family in this season of, of her and Clint's life and their marriage and their, with their two boys. And uh, so we want to just thank Nicole for everything that she's done and also pray over her and Clint's as they continue serving the church and continue serving their family. So this is just a small gift from our church to say thank you. And thank you so much for everything you've done for us. I will definitely miss working with you. I'm going to be very lonely for a little while maybe. And uh, I, will, I will miss our friendship and just you're so easy to work with. And she never complains. Like, never says no. She just does, you know, she just does whatever she's asked to do with a willing heart and a great attitude. So thank you so much for, for leading us that way. And um, we just want to pray over you guys and, um, and then ask God to bless you as you make this transition. So why don't we just come around, Clinton, Nicole, and the and the, and the, and the pole. Yes. And I'll lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Clint and Nicole. Uh, thank you for Colton and Gavin. And thank you for all the life and energy that they enjoy that they bring this family. We thank you, God, for uh, using Nicole all the ways that you have in ways that we probably haven't even seen. And um, to strengthen our church, to make us a more organized church, to make us a church that communicates better, and to make us a church that is more tightly and meaningfully connected and thank you so much for how you've used Clint and Nicole. And um, we pray, God, that you would lead us forward as a church and help us to be wise in whatever next steps you lead us to take. And we pray your blessing over Clint and Nicole and their boys as they have a little more time to focus on as a family at home, that you would continue to protect their marriage, protect their family. We pray that you would strengthen Clint and Nicole in their marriage, um, that their marriage would grow over this next course of this next season and that their family would get stronger, and God, that you would draw them closer to you and to Jesus. 
and help us to encourage them as a church. And thank you so much for everything that they do and for their attitude and how they've led by example. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, you guys. Uh, don't forget, guys, that in a few weeks we're going to have our baptism service on September 19th. And if you have any interest in being baptized, feel free to talk to myself or your small group leader or one of the guys that was just up here, uh, standing up here. Uh, we would love to answer any questions that you have and help you determine if that's what God wants you to do as a big step in your faith journey. So thank you so much for being here today. I'm going to ask you to stand. I'd like to share with you the benediction this morning. From the book of 1 John. So please bow your heads with me and uh, hear these words as we prepare to leave here today. And we know that the Son of God has come and he has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. And now we live in fellowship with the true God because we live in fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the only true God and he is eternal life. Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Amen. Have a wonderful Sunday. Enjoy this beautiful hot weather today.